I would love to see you. Reggie is ill charged or duty in the cell is perishing. Why, gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. He says they can do nothing in this kind. Trust me, sweet tongue tied simplicity speaks most to my capacity. So please, Your Grace, the prologue is addressed. Let him approach. <laughs> <laughs> if we offend, it is with our good will that you should think we come not to off end, but with good will <coughs> to show our simple skill that is the true beginning of our end. Consider then we come but in despite. We do not come as minding to contest you. Our true intent is all for your delight. We are not here that you should here repent you. The actors are at, are at hand and by their show you shall know all that you are like to know. <laughs> this fellow doth stand upon his points. Indeed, he had played on his prologue like a child on a recorder, a sound, but not in government. This speech was like a tangled chain. Who's next? <laughs> Gentles, perchance you wonder at this show, but wander on till truth make all things known. This man is Pyramus, that you would know. This beauteous lady, his be is certain. This man, with lime and rough cast, doth present wall. That vile wall, which did these lovers sunder. And through the wall's chink, poor souls they are content to whisper. At the which, let no man wonder. This man, with lantern, dog, and bush of thorns, presenteth moonshine. For if you would know, by moonshine did these lovers think no scorn to meet at Ninny's Ninus tomb, <laughs> there, there to woo. This grisly beast, which lay on height by name, the trusty this be coming first by night, did scare away, or rather, did affright. And as she fled, her mantle she did fall, which lion, vile with bloody mouth, did stain. And on comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and find his trusty Pisbee's mantle slain. Whereat, with blade, with bloody blameful blade, he bravely broached his bloody boiling breast. And Pisbee, tying in mulberry shade, his dagger drew and died. For all the rest, let lion, moonshine, wall, and lovers twain at large discourse, whilst here they do remain. <laughs> I wonder if the lion will speak. One lion may, when many asses do. <laughs> In this same interlude doth befall the eye once not by name present a and such a wall as I would have you think, it had in it a crannied hole or a chink, to which the lovers, Pyramus and Thisbe, did whisper often very secretly. This loam, this rough cast, this stone that show the eye of that same wall. The truth is so. This the cranny is. Right and sinister, to which the fearful lovers are 
to whisper. Would you desire lime and hair to speak better? It is the wittiest partition that ever I heard discourse, my lord. Lewis draws near the wall of silence. O oh, grim looked night, O oh, night with you so black, O oh, night, whichever art when day is not, O oh, night, O oh, night, alack, alack, alack. <laughs> I fear my Thisbe's promises forgot. And thou, O oh, wall, O oh, sweet and lovely wall, that stands between her father's ground and mine. Thou wall, O oh wall, O oh sweet and lovely wall, show me thy chink to blink through with mine eye. Thanks, <laughs> courteous wall, Joe Shieldy well for this. But what see I? <laughs> no, Fisby, do I see? O oh, wicked wall, cursed be thy stones for thus deceiving me. <laughs> All being sensible should curse again. No, indeed, sir, he should not. <laughs> <laughs> Deceiving me is Tisby's cue. I am to spy her through the wall. <laughs> she will, you will see, it will fall pat as I told you. Yonder she comes. <laughs> oh, all, full off and past thy heart <coughs> and for parting my fair Pyramus and me. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stones, thy stones with hair and lime knit up in thee. I see a voice. Now will I do the chick to spy, and I can hear my Thisbe's face. <laughs> Thisbe! My love! Thou art my love, I think. Think what thou wilt, I am thy lover's grace, and like Lemender am I trusty still. And I like Helen, till the fates me kill. Not Shavulus to Procris was so true. A Shavulus to Procris, I to you. Oh! Kiss me through the whole of this vile wall. <laughs> I kiss the walls whole, not your lips at all. <laughs> Wilt thou at Glynis to meet me straight away? Tell the tide life, tide death, I come without delay. <laughs> Thus have I. Wall, I'm part as charged so, and being done, thus wall away doth go. How is the mural down between the two neighbours? <laughs> no remedy, my lord, when walls are so willful to hear without warning. This is the singing stuff that ever I heard. <laughs> the best of both shadows, the worst are no worse of imagination of men. It is your imagination then, and not theirs. Well, if we imagine them as they of themselves, they will pass for excellent men. Ah, here come two noble beasts, one and a man, and a lion. <laughs> you ladies, you whose gentle hearts doth fear the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on the floor, may now perchance both quake and tremble here, when lion rough in wildest rage doth roar. <laughs> then look, that I once snug the joiner, and a lion fell. Now else, no lion's dam. For if I were as lion, come and strife into this place, for pity on my life. A very gentle beast, and one of good conscience. The very best of the beasts that e'er I saw. <laughs> this lab work doth the horde of boom present. He should wear the horns on his head. He is no crescent in his horns, and invisible within the circumference. This last word doth the horde of boom present. 
myself the man in the moon. This is the greatest error of all the rest. The man should be in the lantern. How else is he the man in the moon? He dares not go there for the candle, for you see it is already in snuff. I'm weary of this room. What do you would change? It is by a small light of discretion that he's in the way. But yet in courtesy and all reason, we must stay the time. Now uh, proceed, Moon. All I have to say is to tell you that the lantern is the moon. I, the man in the moon, this Thornbush, my Thornbush, and this dog, my dog. Why, all these things should be in the lantern, for all these things are in the moon. But silence, here comes Thisbe. This is old Minnie's tomb. Where is my love? Ah! Ah! Well, roar, lion. <laughs> Lion. And then came Pyramus. And so the lion vanished. <laughs> Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. For by thy gracious, golden, glittering gleams, I trust to take of truth this be sight. <laughs> Stay, O oh spite. But mark, poor knight, what dreadful dawn is here? Oh, dainty dark, oh dear. What <laughs> eyes do you see? How can it be? Thy mantle good? What? Stained with blood? Oh, a proud chief fury spell. Fates, come, come, cut, thread, and thrum. Quail, crush. Conclude and quell. <laughs> this passion and the death of a dear friend would go near to make a man look sad. Beshrew my heart, but I pity the man. Oh, wherefore, nature, didst thou lion's frame? <laughs> Since lion vile hath here deflowered, my dear, which is. No, no. Which was <laughs> the fairest dame that lived, that loved, that liked, that looked with cheer. <laughs> Come, tears. Confound, out, sword, and wound that pap of Pyramus, I that left pap where heart doth up. Oh, thus die I, thus, oh, thus, oh, thus. Oh, now am I dead, now am I fled. My soul is in the sky. <laughs> Tongue lose thy light. Moon, take thy take thy flight. <laughs> now die, 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 die. <laughs> No, die, but an ace for him, for he is but one. Less than an ace, man, for he is nothing, he is dead. With the help of a surgeon, he might yet recover and prove an ass. How does the moonshine is gone before Thisbe comes back and finds her lover? Ah, she would find him by starlight. Here she comes, and her passion ends this day. Methinks she should not use a long one for such a period. I hope she will be brief. The most will turn the balance. Which Tisbe, which Pyramus is the better? He for a man, God warrant us. She for a woman, God bless us. <gasps> She hath spied him already with those sweet eyes. And thus she means for David said. Asleep, my love. What dead, my love? What can I arise? Speak, speak. Quite dumb. Dead, dead. A tomb must come with my sweet eyes. These lily lips must be shaking eyes.
ready for death. Aye, I'm old too. Oh, no, believe me, sir. <laughs> the wall is down that part of their fathers. <laughs> oh, will it please you to, to, to see an epilogue or, or to hear a burgomass dance between two of our company? Uh, no epilogue, I pray you, for your play needs no excuse. <laughs> Never excuse, for when the players are all dead, there needs none to be played. Let your epilogue alone. Sweet friends, to bed. A fortnight hold we this solemnity in nightly revels and new jollity. <laughs> of a shroud. Now is the time of night that graves all gaping wide. Everyone lets forth his sprite in the churchyard paths to glide. And we fairies that do run by the triple hecate's teeth from the presence of the sun, falling darkness like a dream, now are frolic. Not a mouse shall disturb this hallowed house. For I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. Through the house give glimmering light by the dead and drowsy fire. Every elf and fairy sprite skip as light as bird from briar. Hand in hand with fairy grace, we will sing and bless this place. Now until the break of day, through the house each fairy stray. Skip away, not today. Meet me here by break of day. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended. Though you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear, and this week an idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have an earned luck, so to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long. Else the puck a liar call. So, good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore men's.
I love the death of uh, Pyramus <laughs> and Thisbe. Uh, oh, did many an opera. <laughs> and all these terrible divas before me. <laughs> in that marvellous uh, uh, death scene. Uh, well done to all of you. Um, you captured all the comedy and the romance uh, of the play. Wonderfully well, I thought. Uh, well done. Yeah. Then to wind up. So first of all, I think you'd all agree that we've really witnessed a very fine performance. Um, uh, the play is actually extraordinarily beautiful. The lines are so chiselled. And um, really, I commend the actors, all of them, so young, some of them, with the young fairies here, the woodland elves. And um, you capture the beauty of the play wonderfully well. Absolutely. Well done. Um, does have to mention that wonderful bottom, um, <laughs> uh, uh, Kevin O'Leary. Kevin, uh, I saw Kieran, uh, Kieran sorry, I saw Kieran uh, directing a rehearsal there some, some time ago, and I must say it immediately sprung to my mind that he was rather like Father O'Flynn in many ways, in that he was totally committed um, uh, he was totally, as were, into doing what he was doing. He was very much a hands-on director, as Father of Flynn himself, of course, uh, was at the time. Um, and he has drawn such marvellous performances out of the young, young actors here. Um, but, of course, one always realises that the best of directors, in a way, is only as good as the cast that he has. And my goodness, ladies and gentlemen, he had a very fine cast. Yeah, yeah. 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 One of the things that really impressed me about the cast, besides the fact that they understood the play so very well, it was all, and that there was great meaning in everything that they said. And that was something that Father Flynn was very strong on meaning, understanding, the feeling that the person has. They had all of that. And on top of that, they all had rather good voices. They were extraordinarily clear. I've been at many a professional production where, quite frankly, I sometimes wasn't sure. Uh, my wife says I'm going deaf, of course. <laughs> but um, quite frankly, I wasn't sure what people were saying. Um, here, there was real clarity all the time. That's marvellous, uh, I must say. A, a trigger to, to the whole cast, uh, really. Um, and it's worth mentioning here as well that uh, I believe a few members of the cast were very suddenly press ganged into taking the over part. And my goodness, they really have come through this so well. I think you would be hard put to it to say who came late to the parks here. At least I couldn't, I must say. Well done to them. And <laughs> Special word of praise for our young elves here, or young woodland elves, whom I thought might put a spell on all of us there, who might all have jumpy heads and tails on us. So Alice Tarrant and Peggy McGill, and Emma Tarrant and Rachel O'Keefe of the Sarah O'Callum School of Dance. Uh, you really did act like, uh, as one would expect, uh, woodland elves to be, and you looked the part so well, girls. Well done. <laughs> Shakespeare's Midsummer, of course, because of its very dreamlike quality and because of its very magical atmosphere, does call for a very stylish production. And really, that was achieved tonight. There was absolutely no question about it. You had a wonderful, very beautiful set. And then the marvellous costuming that was so imaginative and colourful, uh, adding uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, and then, may I say, we have wonderful lighting too. And uh, that comes from a former pupil of mine. <laughs> well done, Kevin. That was rather good. <laughs> uh, many thanks to Margaret Hickey, who provided these marvellous, the imaginative, colourful, uh, delicate uh, costumes. 
time. Thank you to the madam who devised this marvelous woodland set that was so attractive on the Might I say here that the whole We don't mind. Uh, no. We're not that photogenic anymore. Here No. I know. Uh, okay, what we'll do is uh, everybody come down to the port stay up there. Port stay up there. Um, uh, did you see what between the two pairs of bubbles there? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,